Okay, so the setup of Lagrange multipliers is optimizing a function subject to a constraint. And that's actually like a really natural setup. Let's just imagine a kind of basic conceptual example from like business or something. So let's say you have a business where you're selling t-shirts and shoes. Okay, so how many should you produce in order to maximize profit? Well, the more shoes we make, the more money we make. So let's make infinity t-shirts and infinity shoes and make infinity profit, right? Okay, so no. There are only 24 hours in a day. In the real world, when you want to optimize something, you're always subject to some kind of constraint. You know, we only have this much land, or we only have this much metal, or there's only 24 hours in a day. So so that's that's the kind of uh, conceptual setup that mathematicians are, are charged with solving. We don't really need to just optimize a function. We really need to optimize a function when we're we're only allowed to pick inputs that satisfy some kind of constraint. So this is the man here, uh, Lagrange. Um, he was alive in the 1700s, I guess to the early 1800s. And um, it says here that he was the successor by recommendation of, uh, of Euler. Um, as the director of mathematics at the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin, um, so you know that's that's basically the the biggest deal that you can have, um, and this is one of the biggest names in the history of math, um, and so we name this method for for finding uh, maximum and minimum values subject to a constraint after him um, as a way of honoring him. I just need to get this basic fact out of the way. Um, two vectors are parallel to each other when one is a scalar multiple of the other, right? Like, I mean, if this is a vector and that's two times the vector, then that's just, it points in the same direction. It just has a different length. So um, we usually use this letter, the letter lambda in this context. So that's just kind of like our math culture. Um, the subtext here is, so if you see that symbol used in math lambda, a lot of times what it means is that two things are parallel and um, the, the, the scaling factor uh, is, is that number lambda. So don't be intimidated by it. It's just a, I mean, it's a Greek letter, so it's just a choice of letter. So whenever you see this, um, you know, now it's just going to go into your mind as, oh, okay, this is just our kind of math culture way of saying that these two vectors are parallel to each other. Also, one more quick thing. Uh, we're going to use this fact uh, pretty liberally throughout this conversation. So remember that gradients are perpendicular to, ev to any level curve. So um, throughout this process, I'm going to be taking gradients. And the important thing to keep in mind is that whenever you see a gradient, you're just going to remember that that's always perpendicular to any level curve. The hypothesis in this problem is that we are trying to find the extreme values of some function subject to a constraint. So if we interpret this problem as the function we're trying to optimize is some kind of surface, um, then I could imagine that being a picture in 3D. Then the constraint we're going to imagine being some implicitly defined function in the xy plane. So this is the constraint. That means that we're not allowed to pick any values of x and y that we want. I mean, obviously, this surface has an optimum value right there, but that's if you're allowed to choose any x's and y's that you want. This setup is we are only allowed to pick x's and y's that live on that curve. So what we need to do is imagine all the z values that could be produced from only choosing these x's and y's on this kind of peanut shape. And I've, I've done my best to kind of draw this red path on there. The, the 3D picture, the geometric interpretation of this, I like to imagine myself sort of walking around a path along the side of a hill. And then the goal is to not find the top of the hill, but if we restrict ourselves to always being on the path, where is the tallest point on the hill that is on that path? Okay, I've kind of just drawn a little bit of a, a zoomed in picture on the hill here. And now I want to make an observation about what happens if you imagine yourself standing at this maximum value on the hill. And this is actually the same observation that we made 
all the way back in Calc 1 when we were talking about maximum values. Okay, so this point right here is not the maximum value because I'm walking up to get to that point. And then at that point, if I keep walking along the path, I will still go up. So that means it's not the maximum value because you can go up more, just keep walking. Okay, so what does it mean to be at the maximum value? That means that it kind of has to be a place where the path is sort of turning. It stops going up and it starts going down. So at that exact point right there where you're at the maximum, you must be walking along the hill. You're not going up the hill at all. You must be walking along the hill. So that the conclusion here, the observation is, at the tallest point along the path, at that exact point, you actually must be walking level. Okay, so that's it. Okay, that that's all the theory. Okay, this observation, all, all this whole business about Lagrange multipliers, this giant mystery is all just uh taking this statement right here and somehow encoding this observation as math so it, it's really actually pretty transparent and from this point of view about what we need to do in order to encode this all i need to do is take this observation at the tallest point on the path you must be level and turn that into a statement about gradients using this fact that gradients are perpendicular to any level curve Okay, so we're, we're, we're getting really close to having this whole thing set up here. So I'm just gonna put these two pieces together. At the tallest point on the path, it must be level, and gradients are always perpendicular to level things. So at the maximum value, the gradient of F must be perpendicular to the path. Now let's have a look at this constraint function. So the setup is we have some kind of implicitly defined function that is going to tell us what x's and y's we are allowed to use. So that's already a level curve. I mean, if you look at z equals g of x, y, and you look of g of x, y is equal to zero, that is a level curve. So the gradient of g is always perpendicular to the path. Okay, so, so we can put these two things together, right? We know that the gradient of, at the maximum value, the gradient of f must be perpendicular to the path. And we know always the gradient of g is perpendicular to the path. So let's just put those two things together and that's it. That is the method of Lagrange multipliers. Okay, now I'm gonna kind of use logic that's like the enemy of my enemy is my friend, okay? All right, so this is what I'm saying. If grad f is perpendicular to the path, and grad G is perpendicular to the path. Okay, okay, think about it for a second. If this thing is perpendicular to something and something else is perpendicular to something, they must be parallel to each other. The only way that you're both perpendicular to something is if you're pointing in the same direction. So what that means is at the maximum value, the gradient of F must be parallel to the gradient of G. And that's what I've written here. And I think that, that that, you know, if you imagine the pictures that accompany these things, um, it is actually really obvious that in this situation, you know, this is the way that the guy would need to walk if he wanted to go up the hill, right? Like if, if, if you just look at this like 2D plane right here, walking that way would go up the hill. And that way is sort of like right here is kind of like perpendicular to the path. Okay, so... You know, it, it takes a little bit of thinking to wrap your head around, but it is it is really a, a kind of intuitive observation. So, okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. This is the, the logical underpinning behind the, the uh, this is like kind of the theory behind um, this math that we're doing. But, you know, w what does that mean in terms of solving a problem? What it means is... I can actually use this to look for points, just like I was uh, looking for critical points before. I know that at the maximum value, the gradient of F must be perpendicular to the gradient of G. So if I can just find all the places where that happens, then I know that one of them must be the maximum value. So if I could just find all of those places, then I could just like, you know, if I get seven of them or whatever, then I could just plug those all in and see which one produced the maximum value. So that's the theory behind uh, the method of Lagrange multipliers. 
Um, there's a lot of different mechanics about how these problems play out. And, and, you know, usually the difficulty for students, you know, from your seat, from your point of view is um, dealing with the algebra involved in this. Um, but I just want to first just do just like a really basic one um, so that we can kind of, uh, you know, get something under our fingers and, and feel like we, you know, we have a, a grasp on the general idea about how these play out. Because because this is really, you know, this is really the, the magic statement right here at the maximum value. These two gradients must be parallel to each other. OK, so let's find the maximum value of this uh, function here, 8 minus x squared minus y squared. Um, but we're not allowed to pick any x's and y's that we want. We're only allowed to pick x's and y's so that 2x uh, x plus 2y is equal to 5. OK, so you know me. <laughs> I've uh, I've graphed it. So here is 8 x 8 minus x squared minus y squared. OK, so, so this function has a maximum value right there at 0, 0. But Remember, we're not allowed to choose any x's and y's that we want. We can't choose that because that doesn't satisfy x plus 2y is equal to 5. Okay, so let me bring that in. So we're, we're only allowed to pick x's and y's that live on this plane right there. Okay, so you can see when I slice this surface with this vertical plane, I get a kind of parabola shape right there. Okay, um, you know, the re resolution isn't really high. But uh, we're looking for that point right there, okay? That that on that little parabola, what's the what's the tallest point there? Okay, so let's let's jump into it and set this up using the method of Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so I'm using our magic formula here. Grad f is equal to lambda grad g. Um, okay, so this time it's obvious which one is which because I, I, you know, I named this one F, so it's really obvious. But, you know, sometimes when you're doing application problems, it's not super obvious which one is the constraint and which one is the function that you're trying to optimize. So, so like, look, here's just like a real easy trick, okay? Whichever one has more letters, you can see that has F and X and Y, that's three letters, and this just has X and Y. So whichever one has more letters is always F. So the lambda always goes next to the one that has fewer letters. That, that doesn't actually matter. You could still get it right. I'm just saying that like if you want to follow the textbook answers, always put the lambda next to the one that has fewer letters. Okay. All right. So, so what did I do? I set up this equation, right? So I just took the gradient of this. So I'm just putting partial derivatives in each of the coordinates. So there they are. And then also I took the gradient of this right there. So the, the partial derivative of x plus 2y is just 1. And then the, the partial x derivative is just 1. And the partial y derivative is just 2. So, so there I've done it. I've set up this um, statement about two gradients being parallel. It still isn't really obvious that this is going to produce some points, but actually I can quickly turn this into a system of equations. You know, this is a statement about two vectors being equal to each other. So uh, the vectors are equal when their coordinates are equal. So literally all I did was I just took this lambda and I distributed it to both those uh, components. And then I just took the x coordinate and made it equal to the x coordinate. And I took the y coordinate and made it equal to the y coordinate. So I have x's and y's and lambdas. So that's three variables and I just produced two equations. But remember, we also must satisfy the constraint equation as well. So I've done it. I just took our kind of magic statement along with our constraint and that produced this system of equations right here. And now we really get a taste for the power of the method of Lagrange multipliers. Ultimately, big picture, what it does is it takes a calculus problem and it turns it into a problem about solving a system of equations. And, you know, the I can tell you the computer scientists in the in the class are just like frothing at the mouth right now because computers are so good at solving systems of equations. Calculus problems can be really hard, you know, product rules and quotient rules, all those things can be really computationally inefficient, especially if you have like a bunch of variables. But just solve a system of equations, you know, computers are really good at that, you know, so that that's just kind of another sort of big picture takeaway about the strength of this method. Okay, so um, here I have a system of equations. So let me just crank out the answers to this. I think I think that all of you uh, are, are, are pretty good at this and, and, and we'll get this pretty fast. Okay, so we can just use a quick little substitution method on this. I just solved um, 
the these uh, equations here for x and y. So I got x is lambda over negative two and y is like lambda over negative one. The two's canceled there. Um, so now what I can do is just take this and sub those uh, x's and y's in for lambdas. Okay. So it, it really does just fall right out. Um, so I subbed my uh, x in for the x and the y in for the y. That just gave me a simple equation in lambda. Uh, and I solved uh, I solved that equation. I ended up with lambda equals negative two. And then you can just take those lambdas and plug them back in up there for x's and y's, uh, and you get a value for x and y. And that tells you um, that tells you this point right here. That tells you this that maximum value right there uh, happens at. Let's see if I can do it. Where is it? It's at one two. So x should be one, and y should be two. Okay, so there it is. There's that blue dot right there. That um, the height there is three. That's what you get when you plug that into the function. So that blue dot right there is the maximum value. So it worked. You know, um, brilliant. This is just just such an awesome method. But one one kind of just closing thought on this is, um, you know, a lot of times students kind of they kind of get their mind blown by this new independent variable lambda. Um, and it's a bit weird because it's like, well, so what, what is the interpretation of that value lambda? And I, I'm just saying that there isn't one, okay? It, it doesn't, it's basically, you know, just some kind of uh, new variable that we introduce in this problem. But ultimately the actual numerical value for lambda doesn't matter. And, um, you know, there are even times sometimes that we solve these where we where we don't actually ever even figure out what lambda is. Um, but I want to reiterate that this uh, theoretical understanding of the process um, isn't nearly as impactful for for students as actually the algebra that can be generated by solving these systems of equations. So if you're like in a Calc 3 class, um, you know, really the uh, the mechanics of how you push the symbols around on the page is usually the the actual challenging part. Um, so I'm going to make a follow follow up video to this where you know that's just more focused on um, some of the complications that can arise. Uh, you know, I mean, I think you can see this function that I picked right here. This constraint function is really simple. Um, you know, so if you have more complicated functions going on with this, um, it can make the, the process just a little bit more mechanically difficult.